Uh, well, good afternoon and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Ross Virginia. I'm a faculty member in the Environmental Studies Program, and it's also my pleasure to direct the Institute of Arctic Studies, which is part of the Dickey Center for International Understanding. Um, today's speaker is Dr. Amy Lovecraft. Um, Amy joins us uh, from University of Alaska at Fairbanks, where she's associate professor in the Department of Political Science. Um, importantly to us, she's also a fellow here this term, visiting Dartmouth, um, uh, working on a number of special projects and, and just collaborating and meeting with faculty and students here about her interests in the North and about Arctic policy. Um, she um, uh, received her graduate training at the University of Texas in political science, and there she was really um, there she focused on uh, U.S. Can U.S. Canada relationships, particularly issues that were transboundary. And I, uh, I had the pleasure of meeting uh, a member of the Canadian consulate from Boston, Mark Jacques, and wondered why I was here today. And it's because of uh, Amy's longstanding interests in U.S. and Canada. Um, but she eventually moved north uh, to Fairbanks, and she's become a very central member of an important group of scientists there and, and social scientists who are sort of redefining the relationships between ecology and social science around the broad themes of sustainability and resilience. And this is really important cutting edge work, and this is what attracted us to extending the invitation to Amy, and we're very pleased that she came to Dartmouth to spend some time with us. Um, Amy's very active at, uh, in a number of programs at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, their Northern Studies program, and also their IGERT graduate training program, looking at issues around resilience and sustainability of northern ecosystems. Um, Amy's very actively engaged with the community. She's a member of the Polar Research Board. This is a, a group of uh, scientists and social scientists that work with the, the uh, uh, U.S. National Academy of Sciences. And their job is to advise governmental agencies on what is the critical science, what do we need, what are the national priorities. Um, and it's a very influential position, and it shows the importance and influence of her work nationally and internationally. Um, most recently, Amy was a principal on a project called, uh, International Polar Year Project, called North, uh, North by 2020. And this is an innovative project, a forum bringing scientists together to think about sustainable development issues for the North. And one of the major things she's doing here at Dartmouth is pulling together a major book summarizing aspects of this to share with the, the uh, academic community and those more generally interested in the future of the North. Um, her work really focuses on the intersection between politics, ecology, and environmental policy. And this is a very rich, new, and exciting field. And it, it's, uh, as, a, as an ecologist and a scientist, it's, it's, it's very nice to see someone bringing the political dimension into this work. That's the really hard stuff. The science is fairly straightforward. Um, so she's going to be sharing with us today some of her current work, um, some of the themes that engage her, and, and summarizing some of the work that she's been doing here at Dartmouth. Um, the title of her presentation is Politics and Social Ecological Systems the case for the Arctic and transition. So please join me in a very warm welcome for Dr. Amy Lovecraft. Thank you. <laughs> should, should I leave this up or? Yep. OK. Um, well, thank you very much, Ross, for such a kind introduction. Uh, thank you all for coming on election day. So politics are uh, at the forefront of most of our minds. And I promise you this election will affect uh, ecology uh, in one way or another. So um, these are uh, pretty much the only uh, Alaska picture slides I'll, I'll give you. From here on out, we're going to go into a lecture. But I did want to point out um, that uh, I selected these somewhat carefully. The first is uh, of polar bears, which have become, of course, iconic for climate change, even if you don't live in the north. Um, and the other one is uh, an example of an Inupiaq uh, bowhead whale hunt that was successful, but it indicates for us um, how indigenous communities have changed over time. Right here we have them using um, very modern equipment um, to bring the whale out for butchering for their community. So I just, I thought these two um, pictures were evocative of an Arctic that's in transition. Okay, so m give me a moment here to figure out my technology. Okay, so I'm going to start at the end. Uh, this is my take home message. So for those of you who uh, um, get it after this, you're welcome to go ahead and go vote. 
Uh, but I, I think it's nice to start this way because we may take a path that uh, you might find a little meandering at first, and I want to make sure um, we all start off on the same page. And basically, the take-home message is, uh, and I'm going to explain this, but there's a field now called social ecological system analysis, or social ecological system studies. Um, and it's focused largely on the concept of policy. Um, and recently, it uses this word governance. But it's largely ignored politics. And I'm going to talk about um, why this is uh, problematic. Um, when we talk about politics, we're really talking about the fact that political outcomes, the outcomes of contestation by human agents, right, are deep. We, we may get caught up with negative ads, and we've all, you know, we're sort of waiting for this election to happen. Let's get it over with. But we don't want to ever forget that these are individuals struggling to decide who is going to tell us what to do with our environment, indeed with our own selves. And I think that the field of social ecological system studies needs a little bit of an injection of this, a little bit of a study over these kind of contestations. Because when we leave out politics as a variable, and many of you, right, all, all of you, right, good students and otherwise, remember that we think about variables, causal relationships, correlations. If we leave out the concept of politics as a variable, we're going to miss a suite of dynamic forces, a suite of pressures that could help explain to us why there are certain changes on our ecosystems, our landscapes, and our seascapes. So uh, this is what I'm going to hopefully convince you of by the end of the talk today. OK. So here's uh, the path we're going to take. I'm going to start by explaining, um, for those of you who are unfamiliar uh, and those who are familiar, um, the way that we think about social ecological systems as a field of study, in particular from the perspective of a social scientist, which I am. Um, we're going to consider the role of politics um, as the interface between social systems, societies, and their ecosystems, their environment. And then I'm going to walk you through four cases that I think are illustrative of times when it was really politics, not policy. Policy came afterwards. It was politics that drove fundamental changes on our landscapes and seascapes. Um, then we're going to uh, move and talk a little bit about some of the scientific projects surrounding climate change and fundamental earth change related to the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment and how very good scholars are working on this, but that I think there's... Um, there's some problematic angles to the way this discussion is, is moving forward, and I want to highlight those and talk a little bit about how um, social scientists might be of benefit to these individuals. And then uh, I will not take 60 minutes. I'll make sure that we have enough time for discussion and for questions at the end. So let's start with social ecological systems. Um, what are these? Basically, the concept of social ecological systems isn't <coughs> new. Right? The idea comes from the fact that humans and their environments interact with one another. Right? Um, we saw this with Holling uh, starting in the 70s, the idea of just simply ecosystem studies, ecosystem management, right? trying to consider systems as whole pieces. Um, it became later the idea of human environment coupled systems, and now it's come to be called social ecological systems. Um, three things we don't ever want to forget about them because they're systems. Right? So they're dynamic. In other words, they uh, have different variables inside of them that are going to uh, shift and change and be unpredictable. They're going to feedback, right? If you as the human uh, treat your cows in a certain fashion out here in Vermont, right? You won't get enough milk. Then that affects your economic situation. Then you go and take it out on your cow, right? It's dynamic. It's a system. Um, they're complex. Complexity, right, is something inherent in systems. And complexity means that you have the potential for surprise. And this leads to the idea that they're emergent properties. So when we're thinking about systems, right, they're dynamic. They have feedback loops between the humans and the environment. They have emergent properties, which usually result in surprises, right, things we don't expect to come out of a system. Um, and they have multiple variables that we want to consider. One thing that's not talked about a lot, but I think is important theoretically, so I'm just going to mention it, is I think uh, one thing is we tend to treat social ecological systems as quite separate. Anything that's human is social. Anything that's animal is ecological. I'd like to at least point out that I think this is more of a spectrum. Um, when you talk about uh, animals that have highly complex organized structures like wolf packs and um, the great apes, are we really uh, in an ecosystem or do we have some sort of social system going on there? I think it would be very interesting to pursue that line. 
And when you talk about human population growth in an aggregate, I think you're leaning towards a sign of really talking about an ecosystem. So I just want to point that out, that um, I'm going to show you the next slide, which is how uh, we've drawn, we've charted, we've illustrated social ecological systems uh, here in a moment. And I think that that uh, is going to resonate. So first, uh, for those of you who tend to be on the social sciences or humanities side, I want to point out um, when we talk about social ecological systems, the ecosystem component of it is now classically understood to be made up of what's in the red brackets. So we talk about them as ecosystem services. Um, so any, within this field, um, we talk about the deepest level supporting services, right? those deep, long-standing planetary processes that cycle and allow life on Earth to continue. Those support regulating services, right? climate, water quality, and then as human beings, we tend most often to think about provisioning services and cultural services. So ecosystem services are, is the language that we use to talk about what human beings draw from the environment. So these four are, have become iconic in the field of, of study as, as what it is that human beings rely upon. So I'm going to talk about the other side a little bit later. So just look within the red brackets. So these uh, would be ecosystem services. Um, I'm going to give you an example sort of of how this functions. Most of the work I've been doing lately is related to sea ice. And what we did was we started saying, well, if sea ice is going to be um, not only unpredictable, but um, have a directional decline, one of the things that we might want to think about is sea ice as a system, not simply as a geophysical feature. So we uh, got some cross-disciplinary energy together, and we wrote about this. And so if you imagine the sea ice system, Right, is having both services that it provides individuals. For example, platforms for hunting animals, um, buffers for coastline communities, as well as hazards right, for ships um, and for oil uh, drilling and offshore oil exploration. Sometimes actual oil platforms use the sea ice as a platform, so it can be both. Right? If we think about um, the sea ice system right, holistically, then we have a way to really think about how these uh, things interface, the humans and their societies. So when humans encounter ecosystem services, they start constructing reality around that, right? So vocabulary, imagine the vocabulary for ice, right? There's pack ice, land fast ice, fast ice, slow ice, right? Um, our ecosystems in some ways fundamentally shape the language we use. They shape our cultural and spiritual practices. So eco uh, thinking about social ecological systems, I just want to get you set up for, right? Isn't just thinking about how humans use what comes out of our environment but as well how that environment fundamentally shapes our own concepts of ourself and those pieces of the environment that we use. So this is why I have here resources and quotes, right? We talk about usually our natural landscape as resources, provisioning services, right? Cultural services to us. And then we tend to create rules, either informal or formal through government around these resources. So uh, in social ecological system literature, we tend to then start talking about interactive subsystems, which simply means if we want to think of the CI system as a whole, let's take a small slice. Let's say we want to just think about um, with uh, the changing temperatures of waters and the d diminishing of ice and the unpredictability of ice, how is this going to affect the walrus population? And then how will um, local hunters respond to diminishing walrus? Will they be able to um, give good population counts, maybe better than biologists? Or would bi biologists be better informed with Western science? So that would be one particular interactive subsystem. Right? I have an example here, right? the rules and practices of bowhead whaling, right? the social aspect interfaces with the migration and mortality of the whales. There's an interactive subsystem. So you can slice then any big social ecological system you want to think of into smaller pieces. And this is how we tend to do a lot of research. Um, but uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a little interesting. I've, I'm actually very interdisciplinary, but today you're sort of hearing an, a disciplinary talk because I've been doing social ecological system work for many, many years now. But it always kept nagging in my mind, you know, that there were these power dynamics. And I started working with really incredible graduate students, and we started putting our heads together and really trying to think about the role of power. So getting back to, to politics, um, how this functions. So with their power and power relationships, where is that in the system? So I encourage you now to take a look at a, an iconic diagram um, by Chapin et al. 2006, replicated in Social Ecological Systems um, for Stewardship, which is uh, Chapin et al. 2009, 
right? And this is uh, from now our, our foremost thinkers diagramming this system. So you can, this, uh, I always want to get up on the board, but so here, here's human actors, right? They have what we talked about is institutional responses. For those of you new to that phrase, you can just read rules. Institutions are rules, sets of rules, right? Um, there are going to be fast variables, things that happen very quickly. Someone on the ground makes a decision to shoot or not shoot a bear that's coming close to their uh, walrus kill, right? There's slower variables here that are going to relate to that individual. And then there's exogenous controls. Here is our ecological properties on this side, fast variables, right, of what's the weather like today, right? What might be an annual or a decadal decline of sea ice? And then uh, out here we have longer time scales. So this is a, an, eco an ecological, largely a natural science perspective um, with, with social scientists involved to create um, this diagram that many of you have probably seen if, if you're working in social ecological systems. Um, this diagram uh, is, a, is a little problematic, though. And I'll return to the diagram so we don't get lost. But what I want to talk about today is that um, institutions, in fact, don't tell the whole story. So what I want to talk about instead is politics. So I'm going to move ahead to the same diagram that has uh, a couple of arrows, a couple of purple locations here. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this. Um, when we see this focus on institutions, what I uh, want to make the case is that politics happens here, right? Institutional responses are results of, right, people contesting how it is that we want to act, what it is that we should actually do, how should we value what we're doing, right? So policy may be the rule set that determines human behavior in the environment, but who determines how we determine that? It's politics, right? Now, I recognize personal belief systems also play into this. So that's not, it's not that I'm disregarding that, but that's not the focus of the talk today. So um, what I want to talk about is how it is we might think more deeply about what happens prior to these institutional responses. They don't just come from nowhere, right? They come from politics. Um, and then uh, the fact that the diagram has sort of regional governance systems as an exogenous feature, um, I think, is, is a little disturbing as well. So I'm not criticizing these individuals. I'm simply saying I think we could expand this research project to include um, the discussion of politics. So the definition of politics I'm going to use may be one some of you aren't familiar with. Um, if we start at the bottom, there's sort of a classic one that you all get in your government textbooks. I think you all probably have to take Government 101, right? Um, the Laswell's definition, who gets what, when, where, and how. And this has a really distributive focus to it. My uh, training uh, as a graduate student and then my belief system about politics is that it's actually about meaning. So I'd like you to keep in mind when I'm talking about politics, I'm talking about disputes over claims to authority <coughs> to decide what is, what's right, and what works. In other words, I want to draw the attention to the contestation over authority and how that authority, when it acts upon us, constructs reality for us. Right? It, it encourages some activities, it inhibits other activities. And I think this is fundamentally important. OK, so we're going to uh, spend some time thinking about what happens prior to uh, institutions. So politics is not policy. And I simply, this is a little bit more of an academic point, but I want to point out, right, careful analysis can separate politics and policy in research design. Um, so we can think if we want simply about the act of legislative creation would be politics. But it would be everything prior to that as well. You can think about interest group activity. You can think about contestation over meanings of things. So uh, in this sense, um, I'm uh, highlighting two social science areas of policy studies, the policy sciences, which are related to Laswell, talk about it as context. Deborah Stone, who was here at Dartmouth for quite some time, talked about it as meaning. Um, and so I'm proposing that we can research politics as a variable prior to policy. Um, this is with the recognition, right, that um, once you get policy, it doesn't mean the politics stop. We just lived through the Bush era, right, where we saw policy implementation directly affected by political system. Um, and we know as well um, that uh, individuals may personally choose to implement policy in different fashions. And uh, all of this, of course, has a feedback loop to it. OK, so let's go through some cases that uh, help us understand this. The first one is non-Arctic. But uh, I just finished this great book by Tim Egan called The Big Burn. And I, I couldn't let it go. It was so illustrative of what happens. 
Um, so I'll move through the cases fairly quickly. Each one has a different political focus, and then um, we can talk about them later if you want some more detail. But very briefly, this uh, is an example of politics on a national scale and a struggle between an executive and a legislative branch dominated essentially by Teddy Roosevelt and his urge, his, his overwhelming belief in conservation. So what we see from this, though, this, this political movement is a direct alteration of how we think of land in the United States, as well as how we managed forest fires for at least 100 years. We're only now coming out of the Smoky Bear mentality. So uh, right, it starts with 1897, Democrat uh, President Cleveland puts away 21 million acres of forest reserve, right? 1890, oh sorry, I thought I had the wrong date, but I don't, right? McKinley, Republican comes in, says no. Uh, I think that's a really, you know, there you go. You have these two different parties. They have two different platforms. Boom. The reserves are there. Then they're not. McKinley, emergent property, gets shot, right? All of a sudden, we have a surprise. Theodore Roosevelt becomes president, and he's a diehard conservationist. So he then moves the Division of Forestry to the Bureau of Forestry and starts executive decrees, right, declaring habitat preservation. Immediate impact, right, from pelicans through forest reserves, all kinds of species on our landscape. Right? You can't, uh, he put policy into place, but where did that policy come from? Right? It came from politics. Um, he then campaigns on the conservation movement, uh, wins in a landslide in 1904, and we get the U.S. Forest Service in 05. He takes off, right? leaves Taft in charge. Taft is a very weak president. Um, can't, uh, the legislature runs away with him. And then we get right, the Great Fire of 1910, which burns through Montana, Idaho, kills thousands of people. Right? And in the wake of that, um, the politics are fascinating. What you have then is a national level discussion of the fact we must fund the Forest Service. So the Forest Service, which right, was dead essentially under Taft, comes alive again through a landscape forced contestation over what are we doing with this land. And here we have right, individuals coming back into play. And we have then in 1911 the Weeks Act, which gives us essentially the prototype of our modern U.S. Forest Service. But it also puts into place, I call it Smokey the Bear policy, it puts into place an idea that all fire is bad. So tied to this political movement is also a concept of how ecosystems function that flies in the face of what we know scientifically about most forests which are designed to burn, in particular the boreal forests where I live. So this, I think, is just a really interesting illustration to get us thinking, right? It's very obvious, immediate politics. Anwar is another easy one, right? Um, so which party is for keeping Anwar closed? Democrats. Democrats, right? And who wants it open? The Republicans, right? You all just sort of know this. It became a part of these two parties' political platforms, and it was there since the um, early 1980s, well, since the, early, since the late 1970s, I should say. So um, just for those of you who don't know some of the facts, I'll be brief. Right in 1971, we have what we call ANCSA, the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, which granted uh, Alaska Natives um, millions of acres and froze development. Right? Carter comes in in 1980 and signs the, um, what we call ANILCA, which essentially gives us uh, ANWR. The 1002 section is what creates ANWR as a preserve, but it has a clause that allows for drilling if they find scientifically that can happen. Then, uh, right, we go through this political battle that absolutely lines up with party affiliation. So you could predict, right, if, if those of you who are environmentalists or activists remember, right, thinking about um, Bush comes in, you know that if we have a Republican Senate and House, they're going to push opening Anwar and he's going to sign it, right? Under uh, Obama, eh, we'll see what happens, but the, the banking is that he would veto a bill that would come through the House and the Senate to open Anwar. So this is just, uh, we have some key dates here of um, what happens, but uh, you have, so you have Clinton, right, uh, in the Clinton era um, vetoing, then you have uh, refusal, you have a push by Democrats because they come in right after 06 um, to prevent drilling. So again, another example of how politics are directly affecting what happens on the land. Uh, the next case is an example of international politics. Um, and it's a case that I like because it spans international movements, international politics, all the way down to actual local community on the ground behavior. So it's a cross-scalar example of politics. Um, and in the case of polar bears, I, I don't worry, I won't take you through all the technical details, but I want to highlight, right, that in light of overhunting, overharvesting, 
Um, by the early 1970s, there was international movement among these five Arctic nations to do something about it. Um, and again, remember sort of the political aspects of this. In the United States, and then in most, other, most of these other nations in different ways, mind you, we had the Soviet Union at the time, um, it is the national level body here, right? It's our Senate who has to ratify international treaties. So you have a, a local level political dynamic that occurs even though you're talking about international politics. So you have um, then uh, a moratorium, excuse me, the agreement signed that's going to limit hunting. Each country is going to do it in a different way. This comes from research I've done comparing US and Canada polar bear politics uh, with one of my colleagues, Shanda Meek. So that's why I'm focusing just on these two nations. Um, so they went about this in very different ways, which are very evocative of the difference between Canadian national politics, and which is much more decentralized, right? With um, power resting in the provinces and in the territories, right? A major difference is in Canada, right? The provinces own their natural resources. In the United States, we don't, right? The federal government ultimately owns our natural resources. So Canada, you see, you can just see, right? Has a very sort of decentralized approach to the United States. Um, created the Marine Mammal Protection Act. They put in a piece of legislation, and now there's a commission that uh, works around this. What does this mean for us in the Arctic? Right, it means that um, you can sport hunt polar bears in Canada, and you can't in the United States. So um, why is this significant? This is very interesting for a couple of reasons. One is that um, sport hunting in Canada uh, is something that uh, gets people really uh, upset, right? Especially as the polar bear has become an iconic symbol of climate change. And it's sort of, uh, the phrase is often used, it's a cuddly carnivore, right? It has a short snout, it looks kind of like a dog. Um, but the hunting in Canada, in particular in Nunavut, brings thousands, tens of thousands of dollars into indigenous communities. Right? It allows them to continue to exercise cultural practices and relationships to bears that they've had for millennia. Um, on the flip side, right, in the United States, the Marine Mammal Protection Act is, is highly guarded. Right? It is not open to contestation, um, and there's a great deal of, um, I don't want to say tension, but there is tension between how this, this operates at the federal level to the local level. But why is this the case, right? My argument is that the politics of indigenous peoples in Canada is the driving difference between the two. So in other words, prior to just looking at policy, prior to saying this is the policy in Canada, here's the policy in the United States, what I want to say is how fascinating is it to actually go back and say why? Why are those policies really there? So what I've listed, those of you who know Canada would know this, but I just wanted to put up, right, there's it's more recent, so Canadians haven't been always um, on top of um, being respectful of, of indigenous populations, but certainly they've made up for it in a way that's very different from the United States. So there's a strong indigenous lobby that's been reflected through intergovernmental, interprovincial right, uh, behaviors and accords. So I just listed some here. Meech Lake and Charlatan are, are touchstones in Canada for trying, uh, well, first leaving out indigenous people and then working them in. Um, Bill uh, C-31 uh, does a couple things. Among them, it gives um, indigenous uh, women, if they marry white men, the ability to have their children maintain indigenous status. It also allows indigenous people to decide who can come onto their land. There's commissions, there's reports. Basically, it's sort of a shaming of the United States treatment of their indigenous population here, um, except Alaska. We're a little different up there. But this is the driver. These politics are the reason why we have two different on-the-ground policies for polar bears. OK, uh, next uh, and final case is if we're thinking about all these things then, um, how do we want to think about the future of the Arctic? Right, The title of this talk is The Arctic in Transition. So here's where I think politics are particularly interesting. Right, For those of you who are political science majors, right, in our discipline now, there's this focus on prediction. Right, Who will win the election? What will happen? Um, prediction, prediction. We have all these models, causal models. It's all a lot of numbers and everything. I think that's great. Um, but I don't think it tells the whole story of what studies of politics can do, which is probably why I'm an interdisciplinarian and not, um, what, that, that's not, okay. So uh, if, if we go forward from there, what I want to say is I want to say that paying close attention to politics, right, these contestations, um, whether they're at, in some cases, at least in Alaska and in many of these other far northern communities of their countries, really play out at a local level. They don't play it at a national level. So for example, the North Slope Borough 
in uh, Alaska, um, has a great deal of authority, not because the federal government just, just gave it to it, but because the decisions they make locally have broad impacts. So um, the, uh, the future of the Arctic, I think, is really going to be determined by um, a lot of uh, ways in which people start thinking about their social ecological systems, and politics are going to drive this. So th the first point I think most of you know, right, we're in transition, and it's not just climate change, it's also social, right? Um, a great amount of social change, new people coming in, um, people in particular who were interested in uh, potentially the gold rush of the north, not gold, but black gold, right, Texas tea, um, petroleum. Uh, and I think the national politics of the Arctic nations are really going to be deter uh, key determinants. So in other words, what I'm in part proposing is that people should really start thinking about um, national level legislative battles and how these in each in particular of the five Arctic coastal nations, right, Russia, Norway, United States, Canada, and America, how those national level debates are going to play out in international both posturing, right, um, as well as actual policy. Um, one key example of this could simply be the law of the sea, right? The United States has never ratified the law of the sea, which is the fundamental way that we're going to determine boundaries across the Arctic. And that's never happened, right, in part because the Senate hasn't ratified it. Why? What, what are the political reasons behind that? Um, thinking about some place like Norway, right? Why do they um, drill the way they do? Where does their budget go? Um, how does petroleum affect them? So. Um, this is what I'm saying we need to do, and I think these four themes are going to be, in particular, really um, the agendas that we're going to see contested based on politics. First is going to be one of ownership. This is the one you've all seen most in the news, right? Who owns the Northwest Passage? Does Russia, you know, remember they went out and planted the flag down there on the seabed? Does their ridge um, really extend all the way out? So this is going to be a, a really important um, aspect. Who owns things? The indigenous ownership and land claims in the United States, it's settled. Canada still has a um, little bit of settlement uh, to occur. Russia, it's still sort of open, right? They're a relatively new democracy. But there's been some interesting discussion of this. There's a guy named Barry Scott Zellin who came out with a book who actually makes the argument that in 100 years, with the Arctic as open as it is, the indigenous populations will actually own, in many ways, some of the most resource-rich territory, legally, fully, completely own and control it that they might actually end up having the last laugh. Um, so this first one, right, who owns what out in the Arctic Ocean, right? Um, how will we determine ownership of things that float in the sea ice system, right? This is going to become very interesting. And it leads, at the end, these all tail into each other, to this concept of resource extraction. So the next big question that's going to be determined by politics is access, right? And it's not just access to resources, it's also scientific access. Right? Um, if you have uh, a reactionary government who um, decides to become more isolationist and they don't want their scientists, other international scientists to come in, you lose data. You lose data sets, which um, is, is actually very important. Um, so access is a part of that. Third, international politics. Right? Um, how do national level discussions um, play out in terms of whether or not we adopt rules tied to climate change, either nationally or internationally? Pollutants, shipping routes, right? How will this change? And then uh, lastly, I don't want us to forget that I'm not just talking about the national politics effect on the international, but we also want to think about the core and periphery politics. So, right, Alaska is just way out there, way over there in the West. It's a tiny feature, a tiny fraction of the population of the United States. We have very different uh, concepts of our system than people in Washington, D.C. do. Ottawa, right, is not um, in the North similar to other locations. So there's a really interesting dynamic here, I think, too, that's ripe for people to look at um, another scale, thinking about local level governance. So as we transition, um, politics is going to play a key role in terms of what outcomes we get in that transition. OK, how am I in time? All right, uh, I won't, OK, good, we're doing good. So um, this uh, is just a, a reminder of uh, sort of what I've said, but it takes us into the next direction that I, I want to go, and that is thinking a little critically about some of the major models that have come out in the field of social ecological systems study. So um, prediction, again, this idea that if we look at politics carefully and we think about um, politics, we can predict some outcomes, and that can help us plan. So the capacity to understand power dynamics empowers circumpolar stakeholders. 
Right? It allows them to access, and we've seen that more and more frequently, in particular the rise of the um, Inuit Circumpolar Council has been a, an example of this. Um, so my argument is um, on these, in particular, these big collaborative research projects that NSF, NOAA, and other groups fund, right? We need social scientists, not just political scientists, right? But we need to be able to understand and connect national and subnational politics to the environmental outcomes, right? And it's not that policy studies don't consider politics. Right? Um, and here you can think, for those of you who are a little more into this literature, think about um, when Ostrom first started, when she wrote her 1990 book, right? She talked a great deal more about politics, as a matter of fact. Um, the collective action arena, she called it, right? In other words, where do we all agree on our rule sets together in a legislature, the collective action arena. She sort of moved away a little bit from that, but it's, it's there, it's there in policy studies. But today the buzzword, no one wants to talk about government, they talk about governance. So this is what I want to talk a little bit about next. Governance, I'm going to make the case, and you all can argue about this with me at the end, comes from government. Either indirectly or directly, you can't have governance without politics. So this is a chart that um, is uh, another one that's fairly new. It, it comes from the same Chapin um, et al. Uh, book. This is from um, Gary Kofinas' chapter, who's a friend of the Eigert here, who's been out here. Um, and what he's done uh, quite nicely, uh, it's a little busy, but what he's done is he's taken um, Dietz et al. as the Ostrom group, right? He's taken Ostrom's principles that she came up with essentially in 1990 and at our field tested and are accurate. What she did was she came up um, with the concepts that what principles of governance, and here I'm using governance, right? In what ways do you have to manage your resources in order to have them, if they're shared resources, last? So this is a, a kind of diagram that Gary very uh, nicely put together saying, here's some of these things that have to happen, requirements for social ecological government, governance. Oh, excuse me, I don't want to make the mistake. Um, so there's nothing inherently wrong with this, right? But the problem rests with stopping short of government, which is the public expression of politics, in particular because if you don't address government, you don't evaluate government. Right? We tend to shy away from this normative discussion of what is good government. And I think that that needs to be a part of the social ecological system. So I would ask you these questions. If some governments cause better governance, are they better? Right? We like this idea of saying, well, every, every, we're all Western democracies here, we all move along. But can we start saying, can we start looking at and evaluating Right? If we say governance is something we can think of as being better or worse, then what produces that? How do we get at that? Um, second, if governments aren't directly setting policy in a social ecological system, how are they involved? Right? Do they simply allow things to exist? Um, are they so corrupt they don't function? Um, so things just happen? Um, are they actively involved in some other way? Where, where are they? Um, and then, you know, what is this role of the national government and international governments? So you can't, if you ignore, I have this feeling, right, that a lot of people want to ignore politics so they stop talking about government. But it will never make it go away, right? You can't just say, oh, that's politics. Politics determines what happens. It is the action arena that all of our ecosystems are going to be affected by. Okay. Final uh, set of things I want to talk about. This is, uh, for those of you, again, who aren't um, uh, really familiar with, uh, I don't know where the light is. Uh, anyway, I can walk. I have legs. This is, the, again, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, which came out, is it 05 or 04? 05, and um, is sort of the Bible. It, it actually has many, many volumes. And it is the, the, the result of years and years of research among the best minds all across the globe trying to get a handle on where, what is the state of our planetary ecosystem as a whole and its major pieces. And of course, they found you know, terrible things. Um, we have fundamentally altered the planet, and we're in a lot of trouble in many places. This, however, um, if you do a Google search and you look for just this phrase, you, you type this in, freedom and choice and action, you are going to see this diagram replicated over and over and over again internationally. Agricultural societies, ocean preservation societies, all kinds of major groups in Europe, in America, and all different places put up a diagram like this 
or one that's roughly similar. So here you see what we talked about before, right, our ecosystem services, right? This is all, uh, don't get confused, the point is, right, that these ecosystem services support, right, not surprisingly, these four things. But this blew me away as someone who looks at politics. Freedom and choice of action, which is the opportunity to be able to achieve what an individual values doing, right, and being. So how is it we get somehow free human beings, right, from nutrient soil cycling? I think this is uh, a, a really interesting situation. So from this and the replication of this, we have um, some other diagrams that we often see. So people are cutting and slicing and dicing this in different ways. And what we want to understand, right, is that people are basically making the case that well-being, human well-being, comes from having a rich set of ecosystem services. And if you have these things as a human being, then you're going to be freer. You're going to have more choices. But there's some problems with this. And I think we want to think uh, very carefully uh, about this. So the link between ecosystem services and human beings and these four services are meant to make us right, um, have freedom of choice. So I'm going to talk about the purple arrow here and the orange arrow. Okay. The blue arrow, I guess it's blue, a purple up there. For me, it was blue on my thing. The blue arrow tells us something we already generally know, right? People who are not starving generally have more time to engage in politics, more time to determine their own life choices. I'm not saying this is a, um, something we should take lightly, but it's something that we, we generally know, in particular being in a very wealthy country, right? We have uh, most of our ecosystem services supported, and thus we're able to have uh, a lot more choices in our lives. This orange arrow, though, I think is something that we're seeing a lot discussed in the literature. Um, Arun Agarwal talks about it as environmental subjectivity. Other people are talking about it as stewardship. But there seems to be a connection by saying, if you have more freedom and choice, if you are able to more likely do what you want and be who you are, you somehow are going to practice better ecosystem stewardship. And that, I think, is a very dangerous assumption to make. Um, in particular, because if we, the more we know about our environment doesn't necessarily mean we want to shepherd and invest in and take care of that environment. Right? And in fact, a lot of studies exist that would demonstrate to us people who have very poor well-being Right? who are scraping by, have to take care of their environment in a much different way because their well-being is threatened. So this final link on the bottom is where I think we need to think very carefully about talking about things like freedom and choice and how they relate to power dynamics before we get to the end about saying this will automatically give us better stewardship. So if we want, on the other hand, to be better stewards, right? I'm down here, if we want to be better stewards, then that means we actually want certain political outcomes, right? So if, if you want to have a, a landscape that's more diverse with species protection, with fresh water, um, that allows there to be wolves there, right, uh, as well as people grazing their sheep, if you want all these things, you are hoping for specific political outcomes, right? So what sort of contestations are going to result in this better stewardship? So I'm, I'm saying, how, how can we examine this, think about this from a, a political perspective, and can we sought, tie certain politics and their outcomes to better stewardship? Right? And then uh, this I think I already said, but I think it bears repeating. If some governments produce better stewardship, are their humans thus more free and better governed? This is that classic argument, right? If you have a dictatorship that produces a beautiful environment, are we happy with that? Or do we believe there's something inherent in democracy, even if it gives us a patchwork environment that doesn't look very good? Fundamental political questions. OK, why does this matter? We're at the end. So now, uh, why does this matter? I think this matters. Uh, I'm going to be a little academic first, and then I'll be more sort of social. I think it matters for two major reasons. Um, one is that if we locate politics as a variable, right? policy um, happening out here, people's sort of beliefs and general um, existence happening here, if we can locate politics as a variable, it allows us to go backwards. So uh, one of my students, for example, wrote a really good piece on walrus management today as it functions under policy. Um, and he traced back to the politics that created um, the rule sets by the Marine Mammal Commission that allow very specific kinds of handicrafts, that's the actual word, handicrafts to be produced from walrus parts, right? 
but excludes an entire other usage of the walrus. That came from a particular political struggle over the meaning of what it meant to be an indigenous person in the United States. So we can go backward and look for meaning from the variable, but it also lets us predict forward and anticipate how a policy might be implemented, ignored, or right, feed into this feedback loop. So uh, now thinking practically for me, because I like to, like to get out there and think that we need to apply this so we can maintain system function in the Arctic, if we know what issue these policy subsystems, right, I've been talking, these interactive subsystems, what they mean to people, we can better engage in problem solving. In other words, if we have a sense of the politics, right, the contestations over meaning and decision making, we can decide better, right, we can bring more people to the table thinking about the future of the Arctic. What will we do in the North Slope borough without sea ice? Right? It's still going to be there. It's going to diminish. What are we going to do with predictability? Who wants to be in on this conversation? So I think there's applied aspects. Balancing stakeholder interests, creating better planning processes. And then I think there are also a whole set of normative goals right, related to representation, dignity, and yes, well-being. So understanding politics in a social ecological system is valuable not only to the academy, Right, to those of us who want to break down systems and look at them from a social science perspective. But also, I think, very much to advocates, right, which you can see, are there, is any of your environmental groups pushing on ANWR? No, because they know the politics don't support that debate right now. Efficient use of resources. Right? The business sector, business wants to understand how they can go into the Arctic. They want rules. Right? They want these kinds of things. They're not shy about that. Right? The public sector and uh, citizens in general. Uh, oh. Well, so that's the punchline. Now I'm simply going to uh, uh, mention three things that are slightly unrelated so you can relax. You can check out now if, if you need to for a moment. Think about what I said. Get your questions ready. Um, but I just want to mention three things, and that is this is what I really sort of do mostly. Um, I make cross-disciplinary connections. And Ross mentioned North by 2020. And I just want to uh, point out that our, our book will come out. I'm making a book plug uh, next fall. And he'll get a flyer. Uh, so what we're trying to do is create communities of practice. So for example, around everything I've just been talking about, what we're trying to actually do is bring together people from advocacy groups, industry, the academy, um, people who live in communities, and have them think, for example, about sea ice tourism, which I'm working on, I think, here in the future with Dr. Stephen Colt, who you'll hear from later uh, in the semester, um, and other individuals. The next one is something I think uh, might be new to many of you. It's brand new. And for those of you specifically concerned about stewardship, right, the good stewardship, uh, good governance of our natural resources, the Ecology Society of the America uh, is just now starting under Terry Chapin and Catherine McCarter to create at the national level cross-disciplinary connections among the major national disciplinary organizations. So the Ecological Society of America is meeting in DC, and they want, for example, the American Political Science Association. Forgive me, I don't know what the other ones are, but I imagine there's the American Association of Sociologists, American History Association. They want to bring together these people to think about this concept of stewardship at that national level. And then um, the last one, now you don't have to be a graduate student, but um, I welcome anybody, of course, to come to Alaska for a year if you're interested in the Arctic. Um, and I uh, thank you very much. These are my, my thank yous. And um, uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. come to mind, right? And, uh, one is, uh, and this is interesting, my, my sister is actually uh, works in DC in politics. And she just spoke recently, was it the solar physicists? Yes. Yeah, to the solar physicists. And um, her, her uh, so the first thing that comes to my mind when I, when I hear that is, um, one thing, if you're a scientist who specifically wants certain political outcomes, is to go out and advocate, right? Don't think that just by producing science, um, you're going to get the political outcomes you want because you won't, right? We all know science is a, a policy, uh, rather, excuse me, science is a tool used to make arguments for or against certain things. It's not simply accepted as the way the world works. 
So I'll start with the advocacy answer, and that would be that um, if you're a scientist and you want particular outcomes, you need to go advocate. Um, the other uh, thing would be if you're thinking about um, at the other stage, sort of your research level, I think one of the best things to do is to find out who has similar interests and start thinking about um, doing collaborative either research or simply if the research is too much or can't get funded, how you might compare results that you have from different lines of research that are all in a similar system. So just starting those kinds of conversations, I think, can, can take you far in terms of putting the disciplines together. So those are sort of, one was sort of an academic, one was an advocacy answer, but is that what you're, is that, am I answering you? Okay, I want to make sure I'm, I'm answering. Um, other questions? Yes? Um, we the oh, sorry. This woman here in the white sweater. Oh, and come to Alaska. That would be the other thing. Come. You're already going to Greenland, but get on the ground. I mean, that's something that these igerts are doing that is fundamentally important. You're not just talking about Greenland, right, or the ice. You're actually going, and that's enormous. Get, yes, please. So, uh, is this on? I'm really interested in what you were talking about related to national politics on the international scene and kind of how the national processes influence how these issues are debated internationally. And I'm wondering how malleable you think these processes are. I mean, it's, it, there clearly is a long history mm -hmm. that, so if, if you can, related to, pol for example, polar bear um, policy, if you can isolate yeah. kind of bottlenecks in the policy kind of impl implementation of effective um, resource management, Mm -hmm. Can you do anything beyond that? Can you go, can you not only isolate the problem, but what's the potential for rectifying that? Yeah, and I was looking through my notes because I, I wanted to remember the, the date, but what comes to mind is, um, and it was 2010, it wasn't 09, is the recent um, CITES. Uh, so, you know, CITES, the Convention on um, International Trade of Endangered Species, um, when they met in Doha. And there was a discussion of whether or not um, individuals who sport hunted polar bears in Canada could take parts of the animals across international lines. And the United States did not want that to happen, but the other Arctic nations, in sort of a reversal of that, sorry, I always think to look to my sides, in sort of that reversal of protection, 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 squashed that. And so these, these other nations in this international forum um, voted it down, right? Said no, that, that we're going to continue to allow this. So that's, it was just, it arose in my mind when you're thinking, can we actually look in these international regimes at specific locations and think, how does that politics play out? I, th I think we can. That's just the first thing that comes to my mind. But are you asking a, a deeper question about the, the efficacy of a national government? Right, and if you're thinking about kind of more local power versus mm -hmm. centralized power, so you if you figure out one is more effective for resource management, how do you go about restructuring, kind of guiding national governments or local governments towards that? Or is that even well, the, the end of the question is probably the hardest one, right? How do we restructure the United States to, to better steward all of our ecosystem services, right? Well, we'd have to change the Constitution, potentially. Right, among other things. But the easy answer is thinking about it from a very local level. Right? It need not all um, be tied up. So in a sense, maybe I'm actually going to give you a non-political answer. That in some senses, movement doesn't necessarily always have to happen in the political arena. Movement can happen from what we've seen in just the last five years, this enormous movement towards local foods. Right? Now, it does have political ramifications, because you have issues of labeling, food safety. So politics are involved. But individuals, right, on a very local level can make some fundamental changes that um, may not be driven by politics at all. In fact, that becomes quite interesting because then politics becomes um, a dependent variable. And local people and local changes becomes the independent <coughs> variable pushing changes that would um, potentially, I would hope, I'll be a little personal here, change the whole factory farming food structure in the United States. So in that sense, you might be looking at politics, that variable, in a different location. Yeah. 
So you uh, you talk about politics as a, as a variable throughout your talk. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm curious, politics is obviously one of those variables that would co-vary with a lot of other factors. Sure. So in, in a, like a predictive model for a socio, mm -hmm. um, a socio ecological system like you're talking about, mm -hmm. how would you, I guess in your work you've probably done some of this, how would you characterize, how would you qualify or quantify politics as a variable so that sure. actually has some predictive power? Um, I haven't, actually. So I'm, I'm, I'm in the process of, of thinking about doing that. But it's not that I haven't done statistical studies. But I think one of the things we could do, um, and actually I started to do this now that I think about it a little bit with ANWR. Um, and one of the things I was interested in this ANWR project was um, how science was used in legislative testimony to um, push uh, votes in different ways in the Senate and the House. Um, so that could be one thing. I think when you actually get into, like you're saying, sort of the hardcore political science, how am I going to do this research project, you would have to pick what political piece you wanted to look at. So maybe you just want to be very simple and you want to say, um, look at party composition from 1900 to 2010. Uh, what have been the party compositions and how many pro-environmental, code for pro-environmental, anti-environmental pieces of legislation came out? Crunch it all up and see what you get. That would be right, like this lowest hanging fruit idea of saying, I'm going to make my variable party party uh, composition in the House or the Senate, and I'm going to stick it in there with um, coding for environmental legislation. Thinking um, more practically, right? That's sort of an, an academic exercise. I think um, one of the things that's interested me a great deal is thinking about getting into party platforms. So looking at how um, one could code. So here, right, if we're thinking about those chains of variables, you might code party stance on environment by platform. So you might go back and say, I'm going to look through party platforms for, again, we're being simple, sort of pro or anti-environmental planks. Then I'm going to look at um, did the party behavior across a given campaign reflect that platform? That could be interesting because then if, if, again, a hardcore political science project, that might tell you if national parties, right, um, and their ideas, their stated goals for the environment, environmental issues are playing out in local elections or not. So I think the, the world is your oyster in terms of how you're going to code. The key would be what are you wanting to know? And then you could go back and decide how you wanted to code politics. So I don't think there's any singular way to, to code for politics. D does that get at what you're asking? OK, good. Yes, Steve? Thank you. Um, so Amy, if I heard you correctly or wrote it down correctly, you were uh, sort of bemoaning a schism between governance and government. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think what I wrote down is that you, at one point, were sort of asserting that uh, people are ignoring government when they talk about governance. And I think the Kofinas, Chapin, Dietz, diagram was where you were explicating that. Mm -hmm. Now, my question is just to, to push you to help me understand who, maybe it's just Kofinas, Chapin, and the academics. Mm -hmm. um, my question is who is, is asserting that we should not make politics and government central? Because certainly uh, NGOs, advocates, mm -hmm. They live and breathe this stuff every day. So are you, is, it your, is your assertion that academia is sort of dropping the ball here? Yes. So, and, and I should say, you know, again, Kofinas, Dietz, Chapin, I mean, these are big people. They're much bigger thinkers. Or they've been in this profession far longer than I have. And in fact, the one diagram of the two systems I helped work, work on. So I, I'm not in any way devaluing what they've done. I'm simply saying that I think um, the focus on governance does leave absent government. And a look at government, that public expression, and what feeds into government and then produces. Again, it's that, that slide with when we have human activity, right? Um, what is actually producing these institutions? Where do these come from? That I do. I, I do think that there is, in the field of socio-ecological systems study, in the field of people trying to do this human-coupled interfaces, that I think politics does get left out. But I think you are absolutely right in the sense that um, the average person uh, working for the Sierra Club in DC, their whole life is politics. 
right? So you do have people who clearly do research on things like NGOs, right? We have a whole literature. E economics would have it. Um, sociology would do it, political science, on things like interest group behavior and activity. But that isn't yet meeting, really, I don't think, with this discussion. So for example, would we think of a, I think an interest group would probably, where would we put that here? Right here, it would be out in this region. It would be some sort of exogenous variable. But in my mind, I think part of the project is, you know, that kind of activity is actually a fast sort of variable. Right? Politics cycles, right? Two-year elections, four-year elections, six-year elections, right? And those have radical changes. We're likely now to end up with a Republican House. That's going to affect a lot of things, right? So my, my call isn't to tear this apart. It's to say, you know, um, maybe we want to think about this pre-institutional responses more, more carefully. Yeah, so I, I hardly am just coming up with this out of the idea that I'm the only one who thinks this is important. Many, many people's whole careers are based on getting into that politics and trying to affect outcomes on this ecological property side. Sure. D does that clarify for you, Steve? Yeah. <coughs> Well, I'd, I'd like to invite all of you just outside. We have uh, some food, the reception, a chance to talk a bit more and maybe ask Amy about her predictions regarding Alaska politics. Uh, <laughs>